On today's podcast, we have legendary A&R man John Kaladner, the man who was responsible and instrumental for the careers of ACDC, Aerosmith, Foreigner, Whitesnake, Sammy Hagar, just to name a few. We discussed his incredible career in music, at Atlantic, at Geffen Records, working in A&R, the conflicts with artists, how he put records together, what his philosophy in terms of what he signed, and how he would never, ever, ever let a project out until he felt that it was absolutely perfect, no matter what the cost is. And trust me, there were some very, very, very severe costs, and you'll hear all about it on the upcoming episode. You don't want to miss this. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, Insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sat down with legendary A&R executive John Kaladner, who has been instrumental in the careers of ACDC, Aerosmith, Foreigner, Whitesnake, Sammy Hagar, just to name a few. We discussed his successful instincts for A&R, what he looked for, and how all great art comes from psychic pain. He revived the recording careers of Aerosmith and Cher and what his biggest mistakes taught him and much, much more. You don't want to miss this rare conversation. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders, are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source, serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. What do Aerosmith, Cher, Asia, ACDC, and Foreigner all have in common? This week's guest, the legendary A&R executive, John Kaladner. His track record in A&R is unparalleled and speaks for itself. The list reads like a who's who of rock royalty. Whitesnake, Jimmy Page... XTC, Sammy Hagar, Berlin, Susie and the Banshees, Wang Chung, Phil Collins, Genesis, and the list goes on and on. We had the rare privilege of speaking to John, who very seldom gives interviews, and we are very grateful for him for taking the time to speak with us about his life and distinguished career in music. Yeah, this was uh, one for the ages. Uh, I, I was so excited that we got to get him and to talk to us, and we got some really, really great insight and just some very revealing stuff in this interview. Yeah, he really did, Eric. I mean, the, the the exciting thing that I thought was that he revealed things in this that he has never, ever spoken about before. Exactly. And some of them are really, they're emotional, and some of them are actually, you know, very hard. They're heartbreaking. Yeah, that's very heartbreaking and powerful. So I, I'm so excited to share this with our audience because I think they're going to get a great insight uh, into the world of A&R and, and really the realities of it. You know, as an A&R executive, former A&R executive myself, you know, I, I I was very aware of John when I worked at Arista and we had tried to hire him uh, at Arista Records when I worked there and it didn't work out. He ended up taking the Geffen job. But the thing I've always admired about him is that the level of diversity that he had. Most A&R people have a certain skill set within certain areas. Right. John had a much wider palette than just rock. I mean, right. he's well known for rock, you know, with Aerosmith and Asia and White Snake. Yeah. But, you know, he revived Cher's career, exactly. a pure pop career. I mean, it takes a very special kind of A&R person to be able to know 
pop songs and to be able to find those particular pieces as well as to work with rock. It's, it's not just an automatic. It's not like yeah. every A&R executive can work with every kind of talent and have, you know, success on all fronts. That's very, very rare. And the diversity that he had, like what you're saying, not just with rock, but bands like Wang Chung and, and Madness. I mean, just, you know, bands that are coming from different parts of the world and just having massive success. Huge hits. Absolutely. And taking, you know, uh, people like Jimmy Page and getting them to do a solo album for the very first time in their career and pairing certain people together, you know, um, he really had an unparalleled ear for that kind of thing and a track record that I think absolutely speaks for itself. Absolutely. We're so excited to share this with you guys. So insiders, sit back, relax and enjoy our interview with John Kalodner. John, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Of course. You know, I, w I want to start at the beginning with you. I, I, I want to know, when did your passion for music begin in your life? Uh, it's sort of a two-parter. And, and when did you know that it was going to be your professional career path? My passion for music really started um, the time I heard the first Beatles record, which was 1963. And uh, I was 13. And after that, I really got into all sorts of music, but especially Beatles and AM top 40 pop music. Let me ask you, uh, John, this is Eric, by the way, and thank you so much. It's such an honor having you on. Thank you for doing this for us. Um, you know, you started as a journalist and photographer in Philadelphia. What was the music scene in Philadelphia back then? The music scene in Philadelphia back then was very, very active. It was between Philadelphia and Cleveland it was the birthplace of many superstar acts who later went on to play for years and years, such as Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, the Eagles, Jackson Brown. They all played the clubs in Philadelphia, and I was a reporter for the Philadelphia Bulletin and Inquirer at the time, so I wrote reviews, and I was a a photographer as well. Did you get you? So you obviously saw a lot of those acts uh, in their in their early years during that time. Luckily, I saw hundreds of those acts, and not only did I get to sometimes write their bios for their record companies, I got to take their pictures. I got to take pictures of them together. This famous picture that is around I see from time to time of, of David Bowie and Bruce Springsteen and uh, I think Billy Joel or somebody like that. I mean, I, I, I took pictures, uh, all kind of combination of pictures in the early 70s in Philadelphia when all these artists were playing clubs or very small venues. Yeah, I remember you You probably saw David Bowie in Philadelphia at the Tower, didn't you? That's right. I saw David Bowie um, at the Tower. I don't think I reviewed him. I did see Queen's first show in America at the Tower, wow. which I did re which I did review for the yeah. Philadelphia Inquirer. I did review that show. Yes, that's that that, that review is up on your uh, What on tour your site. was that for? The first American tour. Wow. I don't even know what it was called. I mean, Freddie wow. Mercury had long hair and they were, you know, they were just a killer rock band yeah. at the time. Yeah. Amazing. Wow. That must have been. Yeah, that must have been. I mean, it's like so much history, you know, even in terms of your position, so much history that you got to see uh, prior to even getting into the professional music business. I mean, that. You are on the music business, but you're on the, the journalistic side from, from that point. That's, that must have been fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's very um, observant of you because I was, you know, the music scene by the early 70s became my life. And whenever I had a chance to go to New York to interview or review things or had invitation from record companies, I remember standing at the bottom of the stage to see the Who at Madison Square Garden in 1972. And I've never taken a drug in my life, but I imagine that's what it would be like to be on drugs because it totally blew my mind to see them from that close and that intensity of a show and their sound. Wow. Wow. 
my God, that's funny because, you know, I remember seeing The Who in 76 when I was in high school. And it, to this day, remains one of the great shows of, of my life. And, you know, like you, I have seen thousands of shows over the years, but that one really stands out for me, you know, of, of The Who. And it was only four years later. It's funny because that is really true. I mean, I've seen many great bands. I saw saw Led Zeppelin many times and, of course, Aerosmith and all. And, you know, that show particularly stands out as one of the most powerful mind-bending shows ever of all time. Wow! And I've, 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 excuse me, I've seen, I think, in one of my few bored moments in recent years, I counted up the amount of concerts I went to, and it was. 10,225 shows. Wow. Oh, my God. That blows my record away. I thought wow. I went to a lot of shows. I went to maybe a few thousand, not 10,000. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, That's well, I was lucky enough to have a job where I could go see music every night for maybe 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. On all levels, from the club level to the stadium. Right, from the club level to the stadium. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of your work, um, you then were hired by Atlantic Records. And, you know, what did you do for Atlantic in, in that job when, when you started? Well, um, Danny Goldberg, who was head of Swan Song Music at the time, Led Zeppelin label, suggested to Earl McGrath, who worked for Atlantic Publicity, that they hire me because I could, I was a writer and a photographer. Atlantic Records was wasting all this money on having freelance photographers and writers. So Earl McGrath went, hired me for, I think, in early 1974 for $400 a week. And they got, I wrote all the bios, all the press releases, and I took all the pictures at Atlantic Records. Wow. So, so what did you think? I mean, now you're suddenly on the other side. You're on the label side. What was that experience like for you starting? I mean, you had been, you know, reviewing shows as a, as a, you know, critic and as a photographer. Now you're on the inside. What, what, what was that experience like for you? Well, it was a bar bizarre experience because as, at Atlantic Records, you know, I was treated pretty poorly um, working there, although I had a great time and I had great people to work with. But the interesting thing was, which is probably why I survived Atlantic Records as I took the train home from New York on weekends to review for the newspaper, um, still be, being a reviewer and still being in a place where I was highly respected as a newspaper paper reviewer. So I had like kind of a dual life from 1974 until I moved to California in 1976. When you moved to California in 76, John, did you continue working for Atlantic out here? Yes, um, I moved to California because um, I was working in New York and I wanted to sign Foreigner and the head of A&R, Jim Delahan, didn't want me to sign Foreigner, so I went to Jerry Greenberg, who was president of Atlantic Records, to tell him that he had to sign Foreigner you know, I I was insistent, and Jerry Greenberg, you know, let me sign Foreigner, and Jim Delahan told me in his office that he was going to fire me as soon as he could. So I guess Jerry Greenberg knew this. So they they said we don't we don't have anybody in California to work for us, and I, I always wanted to move to California. So one week later. I was at the Sheraton Universal in California. Wow. Had you been to California before? Had you, did you know? I had been to California like uh, two times or so, um, mostly in writing uh, bios and, and taking pictures for, funnily enough, Columbia Records. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. But, you know, what was your experience like moving here? I mean, you know, it's one thing to just be out here on a, in a work assignment, but it's quite another when you're going to be living here permanently. Well, I mean, you. this is a very interesting interview for me to do because these are questions that people haven't ever asked me. So I got on a plane. I moved here to the Sheraton Universal, and I was struggling with foreigner they were recording their record and there were things that weren't going right. So I was kind of ult ultimately focused. They, they were recording in New York. I had to change like 
I had to change engineers, and then the producers couldn't mix the record, so I had to hire the Atlantic studio engineer, who I knew was great, Jimmy Douglas. So I came out here, but I immediately was absorbed with something that would have made made her, you know, if Farner would have failed, they would Atlantic Records would have fired me. Right. Wow. Because of the bad blood with Jim Delahant, the head of A and R. Right. And at the same time. Phil Carson, who who kind of discovered ACDC from their recordings in Australia, he had sent the records to Jim Delahant, and I was insistent that Jerry Greenberg make the deal for the United States, you know, all of the world for ACDC, and that even pissed Jim Delahant off more. <laughs> He must have been furious that so many of your instincts were were so spot on and proved to be not only successful, but but classic and legendary. Yeah, I mean, at the time, you know, I knew I knew what a hit song was from the time I was a teenager. I could hear something on the radio the first time and I knew it could be a hit, anything rock or pop. And so. I just apply that, you know, the first time I heard the demo of Feels Like the First Time, I knew it was a hit. So it just was ex- extension of some kind of innate lucky talent that I had. And um, yeah, I think it pissed, a lot of, it pissed a lot of people off at Atlantic Records that I had this ability. And, you know, Jerry Greenberg with the uh, urging of Ahmed Erdogan, you know, let me pursue it. You turned the job at Atlantic into, you know, it evolved into an A&R job. And I'm curious, the first, I guess, A&R experience from from listening to you was the Foreigner record. That was like your first foray. Were you aware that you were being an A&R executive at that time when you signed the record and had those issues and the mixing problems and, you know, all of that? I mean, did you know that that's what the role you were were doing at that time or was it just out of a passion? I knew what it kind of was it was out of a passion but in true atlantic records fashion and i'm sure if you ever interviewed jason flom he would he would second this at atlantic records they said well you can sign bands but you still have to take pictures and write bios Mm, so um i didn't really kind of really get it that i was in a and r obviously until i was in trouble with the first foreigner record where i had a really make some tough decisions with Bud Prager, who was the manager, about recording and especially about mixing. Since I knew I knew there were hits there, I just had to figure out how to get them recorded, just like in my future career. That's what became, that's what separated me from most of the rest of A&R people. Yeah, you had an incredible ear for that. And, and not only an incredible ear as an A&R executive, but you had a full vision with regards to like the, the, the mixing, the producer selection, the photographers that were used, the videos that were made. I mean, in, in this particular case, was it a case with Foreigner that you couldn't find the right people or you couldn't get the record to sound the way that you envisioned it? Or, or what was it? Because I remember that for, Foreigner uh, debut album. I mean, that's a classic. I, was, I, was, I remember Feels Like the First Time, and I remember all of those songs on that record, on that album. Yes, I mean, I had it produced by two pretty young, um, upcoming and producer team, and they got the recording of the songs, but they had no idea how to mix the songs with power. Um, because remember that Boston had just come out, so and rock radio was king. So the it had to be mixed with a, a power sound with the vocals up front. So in trying to work with them, and then I tried a couple other people, I just decided in January like right after Christmas to go with Jimmy Douglas, who was the Atlantic Records, stu- you know, chief studio engineer, who, interesting enough, was a black guy, which was at the time, you know, a black a black um, person didn't mix a rock record. Right. But he was a rock guy, so I didn't even think about it. Right. Okay. And he mixed with Mick Jones because Mick Jones had the real sense of what Foreigner should sound like. He, with Mick Jones, mixed the record to sound exactly right. Wow. And, and it was a spectacular debut. It was spectacular because, you know, 
it was mixed right. And then I, I, a legend who I always wanted to work with, George Marino, who was the mastering engineer at Sterling Sound. I had him master the record. And it just was, you know, it was just spectacular. Yeah, you know, I, I knew George. His wife was Rose. Rose, Rose. Who was, she, was who worked, she, she, yeah. she was a legend. She was a legend, and she was Clive's assistant for 27 years. And that's how I got to know George was through her. Great, that's right. great. And he did all of, you know, the Led Zeppelin. And then when Jimmy went back and redid the box sets, you know, he was the one that, uh, that did all of those incredible. I mean, that's just one of so many that George did throughout his career. But yeah, he was a, he was a master. Uh, he did in, so many records for me. He did all of those big far, um, uh, Aerosmith records. He, he mastered so many records for me. And I can't even count how many it was, really. I'd be curious, what was the reaction after that first Foreigner hit uh, as far as Atlantic looking at you and saying, you know, what's happening with this guy here? He just delivered this this band that nobody kind of wanted to sign. And now all of a sudden it's like this huge, you know, smash. How did they, you know, what was the thinking then at that point? Did did things start they changing? Didn't. They did not know what the hell to do with me. Wow, that's it. That's so incredible. That that that's what it was. Wow. They had no idea what to do with me because I had urged Jerry Greenberg to take you know Phil Carson signing and make it a U.S. signing, and you know there was a lot of buzz about ACDC, so they didn't really understand. They couldn't get because they viewed me still as the photographer and the right. writer who, who knew a lot about music, but they couldn't really exactly understand what was happening you know john I, i'd love to get into your 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 thinking and your your criteria and c could you maybe share with us what what was it specifically that you looked for or saw in the artists that excited you the most um you know that you've signed a, a, as an a and r executive and has that criteria evolved over the years well it was always about a couple of main things. First, the two main things were always, did the band have two or three hit songs that could be played on the radio? Number two, was there a great singer? And number three, was there a great front man who was a star on stage? There were, those were the criterion I used in the beginning and all through my career. Okay, all right, that's very clear. Uh, you know, uh, this next question is more on the, I guess, the instincts in terms of your experience. And, and you don't have to name names if you don't want to, but I know there must well, have been. Well, unfor unfortunately, I do name names, which okay. gets me in plenty of trouble. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the, the question is, it's, it's, it's an A&R question, which is, I'm sure in your career, there must have been situations where you came across where you heard something and you loved what you heard musically. And for whatever reason, on a personal level or, uh, you know, not creatively, they had the songs, they, they, but for whatever reason, you made the choice not to work with this artist. Did that ever happen throughout your career? Yes. Okay. Um, there are a couple of really notable things. Um, I first heard Cindy Lauper, um, and then... For some reason, I was in some kind of distracted place in my career, and I, I didn't follow up enough to sign her. But I knew she was a she, I knew she was a star. Um, another one was um, I went with Bob Greenberg, Jerry Greenberg's brother, up to see Huey Lewis. I thought he was great, and Bob Greenberg didn't think he was great. I don't know why I relied on Bob Greenberg's taste, but he. I let him talk me out of signing Huey Lewis. And, you know, I, that, I felt that was a gigantic mistake because at the time he didn't have those Mutt Lang hit songs, but he was a star and his band was great. Yeah. And the, and the most interesting mistake that I made, which is very interesting and complex, is I really wanted to sign Ozzy Osbourne. Because I was a big fan of his from Black Sabbath. I knew he was nuts. And I knew about this guy, Randy Rhodes. But David Geffen, who was the most important person in my career, he would 
not let me sign Ozzy Osbourne because at the time Don Arden managed him with his daughter Sharon. Right. And he said, he said to me, I just can't do business with Don Arden. And that was the end of the story. And just one of those things, you know, I mean, he made so many, he allowed me to do so many things in my career, but that's the one time he said no. Yeah, that you see that that's that's a very interesting story, John, because that's kind of the, nobody yeah. nobody knows that story. By the way, that's the first time I ever told that story. Wow, wow. no, no, it's it's fascinating hearing it because that's the kind of thing that I remember. Um, you know, it's funny. Tom Zutat used to, and I'm sure he told you the story. He told me that was one of the reasons that he passed on working with Jane's Addiction. Which was, yeah, that that that's right. Yes. Yeah, because he just felt he wasn't the right person. He, I remember him telling me at the time. He said, "Someone's going to have a lot of success with them, but it's not going to be me." Uh, he just he couldn't work with Perry. He just he knew that though, and it was a shame because he loved them. He thought they were creative. It it, it was you know, and it's one of those things where you know, it, David's telling you even you know the success and everything that may come with this. I just can't do business with Don Arden. And that was it. That yeah. was simple. And, you know, he had never, he never said that to me before. And he never said it to me again, ever. Mm. But he felt strongly about that. Mm. Um, you know, let me ask you, as you started to have enormous success with your signings, did it build your confidence or did it just confirm what you always knew in your heart? Um, it confirmed what I knew in my heart. And as I was becoming more and more successful and having some mistakes. Unlike most people, I just learned from my mistakes. I was really appalled at my mistakes and I vowed that I wouldn't do the same thing twice and make the same mistake twice. Okay. You know, uh, John, you worked with one of the great record executives of all time during this time, uh, Ahmed Erdogan. What did you learn from him specifically? I learned from him that he, that he was completely unapologetic for anything that he did. And generally, he thought the artist had the best instincts. And that's pretty much what I learned from him, that he he was very close to the artist. In fact, I think he was much closer to the artist than I was, because I was much more of a taskmaster than than he was. But he had a great instinct for superstars. Wow. Yes, he, he definitely did. Have, have you seen the house that Amit built? No. Oh, you should. I think you would, you especially having worked there, you would really appreciate it. It's a documentary on him and on Atlantic Records, and it, it covers the entire spectrum up until the time he died. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's did, very interesting. Did they, did they write Jerry Wexler out of the, out of that? Part, part not at all. The, uh, no, okay, they did not. He's, he's actually that, in it. He's in it. Okay, because he's the one. Jerry Wexler signed Led Zeppelin. Right. Yeah. Oh, and they talk about that. I mean, okay, Ahmed, Ahmed says good. that. Yeah, Ahmed okay, says that. Okay, that, that. that's good. He, he says it in the same sentence as he says that uh, he almost, th he threw Crosby, Stills, and Nash out of the Atlantic Records office. And Ahmed was like, what the hell are you doing? I just signed these people. It's a very, very funny story. But uh, That I, is I, funny. Well, if you ever saw their behavior, right. um, you would throw them out of your office, too. <laughs> Okay, I, I want to move on to the next phase. In, in 1980, you joined a startup label called Geffen Records, and I remember this very well because I was at Arista in A&R, and I remember Clive telling the story about, you know, this great executive named John David Kladner, who he wanted to hire as his head of A&R on the West Coast, and I remember him telling me, you know, and telling, you know, we was a few of us at the meeting, he said, you know, we, we can't get him. He says he doesn't want to be the head of A&R on an East Coast-based label. Do you, do you remember that at that time? Yes, I do. Okay. I do remember it because I I was offered, you know, he was one of the great record men of all time. Right. And I still, and same with a few people at Columbia and Epic Records, and I did not want to be head of A&R or anything on the East Coast. Right. 
Okay, so you ended up going with Geffen Records, but but here's the thing. T- tell us about what those initial meetings were like with David. I mean, what did David tell you to convince you to join uh, a brand new label that, you know, had no background or catalog? David hadn't been in the record business for about five or six years at that point. He's starting up something new. Talk about what those meetings were initially like, because they obviously were enough to convince you to take the gig. So can you share that? Well, I mean, do you want to know the the um, undramatic truth? Okay, sure. He had me to a fancy house in Beverly Hills and talking to me about coming to join the startup label, you know, being distributed through Warner Brothers with Mo Austin, who is a legend. And because, you know, I was a slave at Atlantic Records, who wrote most of the history of Atlantic Records, I wrote about the start of David Geffen as a record executive because I'm at Erdogan funded Asylum Records. So I knew everything about David Geffen except why I didn't really know why he disappeared. Right. From the music business. You didn't know it at that time. I didn't know it at that time. So when he wanted me to come and talk to him, he said, you know, this is going to be a brand new label. We, you know, we have, you know, funding from Warner Brothers. We, he didn't talk about it that much. You know, he just had the charisma of a superstar, you know, that he is. And so... I just walked out of the house and I was thinking to myself, you know, I'm going to leave, you know, this great company, Atlantic Records. It's been good to me and I'm going to take a chance. I'm, I'm, you know, um, I'm just 30 years old. I'm going to go for it. If I fail, you know, it'll be a a big failure. If I succeed, you know, it's kind of, I could, I could have endless success. So I just decided I was going to take the chance. Wow. It's, it's 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 a very interesting story. I mean, you just you basically just bet on yourself and on your own instincts with it. Um, and and I bet on David Geffen. You bet on David Geffen, which was always a, a great bet. You know, it's funny working for Clive as I did in A and R. It was an interesting thing because you bring up David. David was the only person. I mean, you know, Clive used to pride himself on, uh, what do you call it, on being um, a, a record man, you know, a, a great song man. And, and he used to say that the only record executive that he truly admired and respected was David Geffen. And I used to say, what is it about David? What is it about David? And because I said, you know, David doesn't possess your skills. And of, of course, at that time, I was 20 and I didn't know you know, what uh, what David's background in history was. I just knew that he was a famous executive. He said, this is Clive saying this, he said, no one has the instincts for talent the way that David does. That, right. that, that was he, Clive's assessment of David at the time. He was right. In fact, no one has the instincts for anything about business, talent, or anything, anything else that I've ever seen that David Geffen has. David Geffen is the smartest person that I have ever encountered in my life. Mm. Yes, a lot of people, a lot of people feel that way about him. Um, and and Clive Davis was a great music man. I modeled myself after his ability to pick songs. He was my role model, and and. You know, I would say this from time to time in interviews, but he was so pissed off at me that I didn't come work for him that he, (laughs) you know, he never really acknowledged it, but he knew it. Oh, I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. But I mean, you know, he would, I remember, you know, when working there, he would often talk about, you know, the signings that you would you know, have or that you would bring over or the, the kinds of successes that you were uh, in, involved with. So, yeah, he he did admire you, you know, even though you he may not have said it, you never knew it. I'm just telling you now in, in retrospect. Let, let, let me let me go back there for, for a minute when you started. I mean, when you started at Geffen, I mean, I remember economically it was a sort of a very depressed period for the music business and a time of change of musical tastes. What do you remember about that time? Well, I remember about that time, you know, I was just busy trying 
to get as much as I could for music on the radio to sell. So I signed Sammy Hagar and I made the Sammy Hagar records. And then, you know, I put together Asia, which was the biggest selling record of all of time. Yeah. One of my favorite uh, records of all time. 1982. Yeah. But it, it, you know, that was one of the worst album selling years. Like you said, it was a very depressed time in the music business right then. Yeah, but you had one of the highest selling albums of the year with that album. Well, it was the, it was it was the highest year. selling well, debut at that year. time. Yeah. yeah, it was, and I remember I remember that well because I remember at the year end them talking about that, saying you know that Asia was. What was the inspiration for Asia? I mean, you, you you're credited with putting that together as opposed to it being a project that came to you. You put that together. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I I put that together with Brian Lane, who was the manager. You know, I, I admired Steve Howe from Yes and, and Carl Palmer from Members Lake and Paul, Palmer and this new young talented guy, Jeff Downs, and John Wetton, who was a bass player from Uriah Heep and a few other bands. And he was a really great singer. Great and singer. I just decided to, you know, rent a rehearsal studio in London and see how it went. And I got Mike Stone, who would produce Journey, to produce them, and that created that great first record. Yeah, I mean, it was. You had you had two massive hit records, uh, singles off of that first yeah, album. That's yeah, that's that's right. And, and you Grammy know, that, nominations that, and wins, right? I believe. Right. Yeah. I mean, that was the the first time that I was very insistent on focusing on the songs yeah was, was that band that that song that album is a masterpiece for me every song cover to cover there's not one bad song on that album that's true yeah so thank you for that and then <laughs> and then later later unfortunately due to alcoholism from the singer and the producer and you know the band went straight to hell right uh, it's always such a shame when you see that you know i mean uh there's so many uh, instances where you know one talks, uh, one can give as examples of that kind of thing. It's a shame. I, I want to ask you. Well, you know, one of the things about it because it caused me such pain is that when I signed Aerosmith and I was having the same problem, and Tim Collins, who was a great manager, was having the same problem, we, you know, were the first people ever to put the entire band and families and crew and rehab and try to rid rid the band of drug behavior and alcoholism and it worked but that the the inspiration for that was the decline of asia you know you you mentioned something in telling the story which i want to follow up with you on john which was that you said this was the first instance where i really started honing in and focusing in on the songs can, can you can you talk about how you were honing or how you started evolving your a and r skills at this point i mean that was the first time where you were you were looking at that did you see that as a specific issue that was a problem in rock or in just bands in general or in artists what, what? It's a specific issue in artists because all artists who is, who are talented cannot hear their own hits. They just, you know, they just cannot hear whether their song is a hit or not. They 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 tend to like things that aren't hits, which I don't know how because I'm not a musician. I don't know how they perceive it. So somebody has to tell them this is the song that you're going to work on or the three songs that are the singles or, you know, I, I was famous for, you know, making Aerosmith do or four or five songs that were hits. And I said, you can put whatever crap on the rest of the record you want. But um, it, I, I was really focused on whether I could hear the melody and whether it was a hit melody and hit lyrics or not. How did you develop such incredible... I mean, like absolutely incredible instincts as, you know, A&R instincts as you had no musical training, as you just kind of alluded to coming into this line of work. I mean, it's just amazing. I can only think of one other person like Rick Rubin that had that gift that was just, you know, an innate thing that they could just f say that that's a hit or keep working on it. How did that develop for you? I mean, it's just unreal. You know, I, I always had it as 
growing up. I knew it when I was growing up and starting at Atlantic, just doing whatever work I had to do. And then I just, I just always would feel it. And when I would make a mistake, I would learn what mistake, you know, where I went wrong right. on judging whether it was a hit or not, and put that into my memory of don't do that again. So, so it was almost like this mental Rick, checklist I, that you had. Yeah. I yeah. mean, Rick Rubin learned this, a lot of the skill from me because I'm the one that found Rick Rubin. Wow. And, you know, the uh, Hovel in New York University when he was a student because he had the idea for Aerosmith and Run DMC. Right. And and you brought him into uh, into the Geffen fold, I think, didn't you? That's correct. Yeah, exactly. You know, John, during this period, you know, after Asia, you also... And, and, yeah. Excuse me, and by the way, it's like... Um, so I developed it over the years, and I've always wanted... I've never told this story to anybody else, but uh, it was a very interesting thing. So I had two big successes with Aerosmith on permanent vacation and pump. And when it, it got to, we got to do the, the third record, which would be, which would be get a grip. They did, a, they did like five or six or seven songs. And when I went in to hear the songs with them and Bruce Ferber and the producer, I thought it stunk and I threw the entire record out and only due to the backing of David Geffen could I even do this. I mean, I ha I went, Tim Collins and I told the band they had to go back and write a whole new record and record a whole new record. So they did, it went on to sell, you know, 20 million copies worldwide to produce all those hits. And a few years later, Rob Cavallo at Warner Brothers Records did the exact same thing with Green Day, which yielded that incredible record that they had because he had thrown out, he threw out an entire record that he had produced because the songs weren't good enough. And I felt that was the ultimate compliment to my A and R skill as an executive. Wow! Wow! It's it's so rare to you know, to have that and to see that kind of, because John, I mean, underneath it all, regardless of, you know, how anyone feels emotionally, or that's the right thing or the wrong thing. It, it to me, you know, working in A&R, that's about, that's ultimately about belief. That's about your passionate belief in what you see in terms of a vision of an artist and how much you believe the potential of them can be. And when it's not up to snuff, you know, calling them out on it. And I know, and I want to get into that, you know, down the road with you, uh, the, the consequences of that, because you're one of the only A&R executives. And it's one of the things I think that people love and, you know, respect about you immensely is that you're one of the only executives that I know of in that field who had the courage to stand up to artists to say, you know what, this just doesn't cut it. And I know that there was a lot of consequences to that as well. Right. That, that's totally true. Thank you for pointing it out, um, you know, one of the long-term consequences is, believe me, none of the artists want to see, look at me, you know, again in the future, even though I'm um, the reason, part reason for their success. I mean, Aerosmith didn't invite me to see their show in Las Vegas. That's just, you know, it's just really, you know, David Coverdale decided, he announced on the internet a few months ago that he doesn't want to have anything to do with me, even though I haven't had to do anything with him for years so you get a lot of the bad feelings from the artist because you had to tell them that their songs were not good or they had to redo them or redo their vocals i mean it comes with a downside to it which i which i was willing to take no i know you were but you know when you have the track record that you did and the track record being immense success, not once, not twice, but, you know, 10, 11, 12 times over and over and over with, with not only an Aerosmith, but with an Asia, but with a Madness, with Wang Chung, with Berlin. I mean, you know, it, you, you, you begin to realize, you know, this is not just a fluke. And yet I totally understand what you're saying, because I used to see that same thing happen with Clive, although Clive was a little different. He, he he wouldn't do this. 
he wouldn't do what you do to self-contained AOR artists, interestingly enough. He would only do it to the pop acts that he used to say have no other way of having success other than, you know, hit singles on pop radio. He would never tell Grateful Dead or the Kinks or anyone else. You know? Right. Well, that's why that's yeah. why none of his AOR artists ever made it big. Exactly. And yeah. And he, you know. And yet, you know, he had a history with AOR in the 60s, I guess, and early 70s, but that was a different time, you know? But that's right, a, that's that, was a, a, that was a different time, exactly. Exactly. You know, I, I want to talk about that era with you at, at Geffen, because during this time, you also had huge success with bands, like I mentioned, like Wang Chung, Berlin, Madness. And it's interesting, I, I mentioned Wang Chung, because Arista had, you know, we released the first Wang Chung album in the U.S. How yeah, did you, that's right. Yeah, how did you come to sign them at Geffen? What, 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 how did that come to be? Well, their manager, David Massey, came to me and he said he didn't think Arisa was going to pick up the option. And I went to David Geffen and he told the lawyers to, you know, try to get Wang Chung, you know, out of the out of the, I don't know if they got out of the contract or they were dropped. I'm not actually, actually sure, sure of the circumstances because I was focused on, first of all, changing the stupid spelling of their name, right? Which was ridiculously spelled, and then focusing on that they needed to have hits, and Jack Hughes needed to be focused to write hits, and I would. I was put all this energy into getting this amazing producer, Chris Hughes, to produce them. Yes, he certainly was. So I was very focused on, I, I don't, like I said, I'm not even sure how I was lucky enough to get them, but I, I had a whole plan that took me quite a while to put together to get this producer with, with Chris Hughes. Tell me what it was about them. I mean, you, you didn't have, they didn't come, did they come to you with, with, with great songs or did they, was it just the first album? What was it that made you say, this is right for me to sign? They, they had a very interesting sound and I, th I thought that um, Jack Hughes was, was a great singer. And when I saw them, I just thought there was something, there were a three piece, there was just something about them I liked and I liked the manager, and it was just, you know, I think they they might have had some fragments of songs that I thought I could work with, with with this great producer, which ended up being the case. Absolutely, and and I think Chris went on to do the Tears for Fears record, didn't Tears he? Tears for Fears, yeah. that's right. Yeah, he did two albums with them that were just massive. massive. Right. Yeah, huge, brilliant albums. And he, you know, he was an incredible, Incredible musician at the time I was working with all these British bands. I was I worked so hard because I really wanted to have a band with Chris Hughes on drums and uh, Mud Lang singing because he was is an incredible an R and B oh, singer. Yeah, he is. And so I, I you know I could never exactly get it together, but I was all the time I was doing all these different things, madness and all the stuff in England with in Asia. I was trying to put the the producers band together which i never could achieve oh well you know your, your instincts are right on the money i mean that's uh, that's a great one i mean mutt went on to do all those incredible vocals on the uh, on the def leppard records you know i mean yeah his all, voice. all of them yeah, yeah. absolutely and and acdc back then. yeah he did all of those vocals on um highway to hell and back in black back in black exactly Exactly. Let me ask you, John. Did did any of your A and R signings in your career far exceeded your expectations? Um, that's really a good question. I mean, it's kind of hard with your track record, but I'm just <laughs> wondering. You know, did you have one that you were like, "Wow, this is," you know, didn't think this was. I really can't think of one that that stands out. Um, I thought Sammy Hagar was great, but when I put him into Van Halen, you know, I thought he, he, he was amazing. So he kind of exceeded my expectations when he was in that band. Okay. But yeah. I can't think of, of some, something that I signed out right. I always thought, I mean, even the Nelson twins, I thought were going to be amazing until they decided to, to want to do their own record on the second album. Mm. Yeah. 
Interesting. Which, which, you know, would happen a lot if some, like, you know, they went to Ed Rosenblatt and he said yes, and then they became nothing. John, let's talk, you know, I want to talk about Aerosmith now. I mean, it's probably one of your most successful signings at Geffen. And you signed them at a time when they had been very cold for several years and had a lot of internal problems. C- can you talk about the the initial meetings with them? I mean, were you aware of the issues that you were going to face in working with them or, or no? You know, I really wasn't. I mean, I wanted to sign them so badly. And it's one of those things where just like everybody else, when you're you know, with a superstar or somebody who was successful, you kind of look the other way. But I could see that it was a train wreck, you know, just generally. And Tim Collins was just holding it together by sheer will. And, and you know, if it, and I made <clears throat> one of the reasons that I went on to make so many great records in the 80s and 90s is I made that terrible record with Ted Templeman, who was my hero as a producer, done with mirrors with Aerosmith. This was one of the worst records ever, one of the worst productions ever, some of the worst songs ever, and some of the worst singing playing ever. So that was my doing. That's 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 all on me. But I learned from it. And so in order to work with Aerosmith, Tim Collins decided that they were either going to get be cleaned up off of drugs and alcohol or not, you know, not go on because I David Gaffin wanted to fire me after that done with mirrors album. Wow. Really? Just the, yeah. wow. One, one bad album. And well, you're, because you're also, also the, at the same time, I couldn't get David Coverdale to sing the, what went on to be the big eight, album of 1987 the white snake album right the at that so time. it okay. was it was one of those I, I had an 18th month period i had always produced hits for atlantic and geffen and for 18 months i was completely cold i made this terrible aerosmith record and i couldn't get david coverdale to sing his record so you know i think that he was thinking about it huh and, and that leads me to the, the question, which, you know, you just obviously talked about in depth that, you know, the first al- album you obviously released with them was that Done With Mirrors record, which which obviously didn't do too well. What was your plan moving forward with them at that point in time? You know, uh, obviously you just alluded to David wanted to fire you. How are you planning to move forward with Aerosmith? And, you know, how did David take a, another chance on that? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean... You know, he he told me, you know, we had very f- few, um, you know, serious conversations about things. And he told me he never wanted me to make a record like that again. And, you know, I wanted him to sign Aerosmith. He made it happen. And, you know, he thought that that might have been a mistake. And um, obviously in more colorful language. <laughs> but um but he said you know you you better get it excellent right this n- next time yeah so um obviously a gigantic part of the problem was Ted Templeman who was one of the great producers of the 80s right. he oh. was also on drugs oh, as no. well as well as Aerosmith wow so i immediately went went over to Warner Brothers Records no one had ever done this before and I immediately went in his office and I said, you know, you know, you're fired from Aerosmith. I'm not going to have you produce them a- again. And I'm sorry, but I'm sure no one ever comes and tells you this. But, you know, I just think you made a terrible record and you're fired. Wow. And then Tim Collins and I laid out a plan to have them go to various treatment centers in the fall of 1986 to resolve the substance abuse issues, which is how I learned all about this and used it many times in later years on musicians and various famous people, including politicians, on how to do this. And uh, it came from the pain of what had happened to Asia. Yeah. You know, wow. that I, and I didn't know how to do it. 
do it then. I didn't know about right. rehab or I didn't know about drug interventionists, which you need to get the people to go to rehab. But you learn from that mistake like you did in your previous ones and kind of check that off your list and say, I'm never going to let that happen again. That's right. Yeah. You know, because I, I, I had no control of Aerosmith. So I kind of had, had to let them, you know, fail miserably. And then I could step in with Tim Collins, the manager, he- very heavy handed about how it was going to be, what the songs were going to be like. They had to write with co-writers and they're going to be produced by Bruce Fairburn, all of which they resisted. Yeah, that's what but, I was just going to ask you. What was the mood like then? They must have just, you know, wanted they, to... the, the mood was F you. Yeah, exactly. That was the mood. Wow. Not so much, you know, well, Steven Tyler as well, but the the band, you know, the Li Three were always against me. Hmm. Well, you I, know what the Li Three is, right? No, the least important three: <laughs> Hamilton, Kramer, yes. and okay. um, right. And Whitford. 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 Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's safe, you know, or it's fair to say after that mandate from David Geffen uh, to clean this up on the next uh, go around that the follow up albums, Permanent Vacation and Pump, restored them to worldwide prominence due in no small part to your incredible A&R skills, you know, that resulted in the massive hits. Dude Looks Like a Lady, Janie's Got a Gun, Love in an Elevator, Angel and Ragdoll, on and on and on. Can you can you take us through that process? I can, you know, I can only imagine that it must have been very difficult creatively. Difficult and painful. And, you know, to this day, I still hear how you know, I ruined Steven Tyler's songs. I killed his children, which are his songs. You know, he he still hates to sing Ragdoll because it was Ragtime and I made him change the lyrics. I didn't know what the hell Ragtime was. Um, you know, all I, it was a fight about every single song. Wow. But I just can't understand you know, on, that even on, after on, the massive success, I mean, you know, you figure. I mean, on, for instance, on Get a Grip, crying. He, when I, I had him go right with Taylor Rhodes, this great Nashville guy who was on a, sh- a huge, great writing streak, really talented, really a great person. And he comes up with this great melody with Taylor Rhodes, which is crying, and he only had Taylor Rhodes gave him this one word, crying, for the for the chorus, and he just refused to write the lyrics for the song. So they're recording in Vancouver, you know, get a grip, and you know, two or three of the songs, which are the most important commercial songs, he just was just fighting me in writing the lyrics, you know, and I just kept the pressure on i mean you know i'm sure it's it's taken years took years off my life really because he is an incredibly talented superstar person and very difficult to engage with and fight with somebody like that oh i would imagine i mean they're people like that are are formidable um in and you know right but you see Somebody like Steven Tyler is so talented, he can do anything, and I knew it, and I wasn't going to give up that he could do any. I was just not going to give up. It's just that simple until I just couldn't, until, you know, he he wanted to fire me a few times, and his manager, Tim Collins, did not let him. But that's how, how he did it would get. Let me ask you, John, you know, in in listening to you, I'm realizing, you know, it's about your passionate love for them and belief in his talent. Did you ever tell, did you ever try that tactic with him? Did you ever, were you ever able to have the conversation about, you know, I I believe in you so much and and you are so amazingly talented, which is why I fight for getting the best out of you and, and what I know you truly can be? Or what was he just not open to that? I used to tell him that, but it wasn't at the time when we were trying, when we were fighting about, you know, the writing of the songs. It just didn't coincide. You know, many times I would talk about that I had total faith in his talent, which I did, but it it didn't usually come up in the song, the painful songwriting time, because, you know, most great artists, 
after their first record, it's incredibly painful that for them to write songs, which I don't know exactly why, but it is. Hey, Insiders, we hope that you're enjoying our featured interview. Before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. So, hey, Rich, tell me a little bit about the Music Business Registry. Well, what we are, Music Business Registry is the leading contact directory. We publish all of the most current, accurate, and up-to-date contact information for the music industry. We do directories for A&R. We do directories for music publishers. We do directories for film and television music. We do directories of artist managers, and we do directories of music attorneys. And we also sell other uh, publications too, like the Indie Bible Series, the YouTube Bible Series, the Indie Spotify Bible Series, and other things as well. That's what we're about. So if I wanted to find out, let's say, the music supervisor for American Horror Story, I can kind of go into the film and TV uh, monthly and find the information that I need there? Well, we don't list specific shows. What we do list is we, y- y- if you know who the music supervisor is, and you can find that out on IMDB, then you can find their contact information. Uh, and we have that in our film and television music uh, monthly. Absolutely. Yes. That's great. And I hear that we have a a discount right now. If you go to musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll receive 10% off your first order. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. We offer that to all of the uh, MUBUTV insiders. So insiders, check out musicregistry.com and use MUBUTV10 as your coupon code. I remember an interview you once gave where you talked about this subject around the subject of of great art, and you said all great art comes from immense psychic pain or hunger. That's right. Yeah, and and, and, and can can you expand upon that? I mean, in your experience, because you've certainly worked with brilliant artists where that's, (laughs) that seems to be the... uh, the, uh, Par for the course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, all the artists that I've worked with or the great actors or directors that I've been around, all of the great art comes from, you know, immense psychic pain. You know, I don't, that's what kind of creates the art, the huge ego and, and insecurity and talent all fighting within the person's brain. Yeah, very much so. And you know, Clive used to always say one of the reasons that he could never be friends. He used to say, you know, throughout my career, he said, you know, I've 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 only had one person who's an artist in my entire life that I was ever friends with. And I said, who was that? He said, Paul Simon. And I said, why do you feel you could never be friends? You know, or, or you never. Were? And he said, because he thinks that artists were too selfish, self-centered. Uh, self-absorbed, thought only of themselves, and he felt at the same time when he said that, he said, and I also see that from my experience, the ones that I've worked with who were great had to be that way, that it was part of the fuel for their brilliant creativity. That's totally true. Yeah. And what you're saying... I mean, no no artists are my friends. No artists were ever my friends. Okay, and you got that. You got that innately. And I got that, clearly. Yeah. And David Geffen once told me when I was becoming on my rise to my my great abilities later on, he said artists will never be your friend and don't don't confuse it and make sure that Geffen records and Geffen, you know, just the whole entity of Geffen comes before your friendship to the artist because you won't get your friendship from the artist. Absolutely. And it, it's it's very true. You know, I, I want to ask you, you ended up doing over a dozen albums, uh, I think, with Aerosmith at two different labels, at Geffen and uh, uh, again at Columbia. Is there any one particular album that really stands out to you and in, in that experience that of, of, of work that you did with them? And if so, what is it and why? I think Get a Grip stands out because Bruce Fairburn and the band were at such a creative peak and it just was, it was exactly the right time. Their abilities were extremely high. Um, I got Brendan O'Brien to mix that album, which was also something that was amazing. Yeah, he's brilliant. The mix of that album. So 
they their their album Pump was amazing as well, but I think their their peak was Get a Grip. Steven Tyler's incredible creativity was definitely at its peak then. Um, you know, once you go on the road and you sell out, you know, all the dates worldwide and you get tired and you and you absorb 20,000 cheering fans a night, it starts to warp, warp the artist after that. Mm. Yeah, their sense of reality. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, you know, as, as you're saying that, I'm, I, I was thinking of like, you know, certain periods in t- of time. I mean, I, I was thinking of the Rolling Stones from like 68 to 73, and that astonishing output of four albums, one after the other, that one was just more brilliant than the next. Uh, and, and in relation to your comment about, you know, how did they maintain that connection or, you know, staying in that zone, you know, during that time when they were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and the work was just, you know, astonishing. Right. Well, it's just, it's the same thing because of the superstardom of Mick Jagger and and Keith Richards. It's just, you know, there's a certain synergy with the two people, you know, similar to um to Steve Perry and Neil Schoen for for Journey. It it just there, you know, there are certain moments in time which last two, three, four, five years that are magic and can't be ever duplicated yeah. and usually can't even be equaled by most people. Yeah, it's like it's like you were saying all of those elements coming together in a in a synergistic symbiotic way, uh you know, where the where the stars have aligned creatively, personality-wise, career-wise, uh emotionally and it just works. Yeah, look at Lou Graham and Mick Jones the run they went on for three or four records, it was just beyond amazing. Their their incredible synergy with that music. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you look at the first four albums. I mean, I, I one time heard a, a great story that Mick Jones told about Foreigner 4, where he said he wanted Mutt Lang to produce it. And he said Mutt came to see him. He gave him the tape I think of of the songs that he wanted, and he didn't hear from him. As Mick Jones tells this in the in the interview, and he says he called up Mutt and said, you know, so like a week and a half later, and he said, so what did you think? And he says, you know, will, will you produce the record for us? And and he says Mutt said to him, well, you know, maybe when you have some songs, I'll consider it. <laughs> and 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 he tells that story, and and Mick Jones said. Only because of my absolute respect for Mutt Lang would I be able to hear that from from him uh, and go back and write, you know, what was, I think, Jukebox Hero. Urgent. You know, urgent. And, and the other one was uh, the ballad, uh, Waiting for a Girl Like You. But right. he, he came up with those after Mutt said, you know, essentially, you know, what, what, what you have battled with, with bands your whole life uh, with, John, is that thing of, you know, this is not good enough and I'm not going to give my time. Um, so it's, yeah, and, and the result of that album, I mean, that's a classic album. I mean, when you look at that, that, that album. Right, that, that's right. And, you know, Rick Rubin, to a, to a certain extent, learned that from me. Of, you know, f- he, he would do it by being friends with the musicians as opposed to, to me being like, Kind of the boss, right? Um, but he, he his method was fairly effective for a certain period of time. Yes, it it, it, it certainly was. Um, it's it's a much different kind of style. I, I want to ask you something on, on a personal level, John, of, of you as a as a as a person and as a personality. You, you became a personality in your own right. I mean, having appeared in several of the the Aerosmith videos and 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 things like that. And I'm wondering, was that by accident or by design? Well, the first video that I was in was Sammy Hagar, I Can't Drive 55. Right. And it was Sammy Hagar and Gil Bettman, the director's idea. So after I was in that and I got some feedback, then I think William Freakin had me do 
something with Wang Chung for Live and Die in L.A. because I convinced them to do the soundtrack. Okay, which was brilliant. And then it kind of took off from there where I kind of enjoyed it. I kind of enjoyed becoming like a semi-celebrity and semi-known to the public. I didn't want to perform, but I enjoyed you know, be having a certain image, um, which I promoted obviously from wearing the white suit and, you know, just the things that I did. And I really enjoyed, you know, forming an image for myself. Yes, you did. And then, you know, I think probably most people, it must've been taken to a new level with, uh, the dude looks like a lady video. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but you know, the funny thing is, that that was Steven Tyler's punishment to me for making him write with Desmond Child to change the lyrics. For that song? Because, yeah, because he wrote the song was, he wrote the song was called Groovin' with the Ladies. Ah. And I said, that's the stupidest lyric I've ever heard (laughs) for a great song. Right. So he couldn't come up with it, so I sent Desmond Child up there. They wrote this great song. Bruce Fairburn produced this great song. And he, how I know this is he told Rick Rubin, I'm going to put Collodner in a girl's wedding dress so that he'll look like an ass. Uh, (laughs) Wow. So that was like his punishment. But I I mean, but did they ever relent at some point and, and say... Jesus, you were right. You were right this time. You were right that time. I mean, was there ever a point? Never. Wow. Never. Okay. My and God. and did, did do you, I told you, did you see that I got invited for one time to see them in Las Vegas? No. That's so and I, and he even he even called me to find out where some of the multi-track stems were from some of the songs that, you know, he wanted to have in reserve for Las Vegas. So that's the thanks that I get. Wow, that's so sad. And, you know, there's a little known fact because, you know, this guy on the Internet quotes my net worth at $50 million. But one the thing that he doesn't know is I never got royalties from ever, any artist ever one oh. dime. How I just made I just made money from I got really good well paid by David Geffen and Sony Music really well paid but I've never made any royalties from anybody so this guy I guess calculated how many records I sold at a 1% royalty came up with 50 million dollars. Wow. How interesting. Yeah, he must have assumed that that was your your deal because I mean some A&R people I guess got overrides, you know, in that era. You know that. I mean that was Yeah, but I think, I, I right. did not. But you know, I I was not I was not ever doing it for the money, not one second. No, well, obviously. Not. Yeah, yeah, obviously not. I was doing it number 1 for the music, number 2 from my from my own ego and my own image. Okay. I mean, wrong or right, that was number two. But number one was always about the music. Yeah. Yeah, and you certainly and it proved. Shows. Yeah, yeah, it shows, and you certainly had the track record. And the proof was in the pudding over, as I said, you know, John, I just got to tell you on a personal level, one of the things that I've always loved about you and so profoundly respected about you as an A&R executive is that, you know, working in A&R is that you had such a broad breadth of talent in A&R in, in areas that most a and I mean, I don't need to tell you, most a and executives didn't have. And, and we're going to talk about that, that, you know, the skill sets of working with, you know, an Asia are totally different than working with a share. And yet you, right. you were very R-X-T, successful. R-X-T-C. See, exactly. And yet you possessed all of that. And that was an extremely, I mean, I, you know, there, there's, you can count on one hand in history how many people have that. And it's, it's just what I've always respected about you. Uh, well, in the field. Well, thank you. I mean, you know, most people don't know I signed Susie and the Banshees. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a kind of a strange fact. No, and it's it just goes to my to, to my point. So, anyway, John, uh, we we spoke a little bit earlier about David Coverdale and White Snake, which was obviously another one of your enormous successes. 
How did you come to signing him? And uh, what was the process like making their Geffen self-titled debut? Because obviously they had a bunch of other albums that came out before that. Well, I mean, I always thought David Coverdale was one of the greatest singers in the world. And so I went to sign him and David Geffen was not convinced. So I signed him for U.S. and Canada and Rupert Perry still had him for Europe and then called my friend Jack Matsumura at Sony Japan who signed White Snake for Japan. So I made this 84 record with them, which, you know, was fair, was quite successful, but I knew I had to get rid of the producer, Martin Birch, right. which Coverdale fought me about. Hmm. And I knew I had to get rid of most of his band because they were not good. Right. So I eventually put him with John Sykes to write the songs. I wrote the songs. I got Mike Stone to produce them. And then David Coverdale started to hate out on John Sykes and Mike Stone. Also, he couldn't sing the record. So I took him to many doctors, many ear, nose, and throat doctors. I had a, He had ear, nose, and throat surgery with Joe Sugarman. You know, we went to various other things. And I finally, we used every superstar producer in the world. Finally, Keith Olsen got him to sing the 87 record when where he sang it great but it was that was another thing where those were the two problems that i had with david geffen ever was the, the bad aerosmith record i made and taking over two years to finish the follow-up to the 84 slided in white snake record because he said why can't you get this done i said because i'm i'm i said i'm doing my best i said I'm trying my best. And David Geffen said to me, don't try, do. Mm. So um, I just did whatever I could to get him to finish the record. And he wouldn't talk to John Sykes or Mike Stone. So I got Keith Olsen to mix it. And then when it was all finished, I decided that... I decided that here I go, here I come again. With here I go again, it was not co- correct. So I set up a session with all the great LA studio musicians and David Coverdale singing, and that's the single of "Here I Go Again." Wow! So you re-recorded it? I completely re-recorded it with Keith Olsen producing in Jan in January of 1987, three months before the album came out. Wow. And and was it your idea, or you, did you mastermind putting the band together? You know, Rudy Sarzo? It was my idea. I put the band together. I masterminded it, both the band that played the record and, and the band that then was in all the videos and started to, to tour live. It was kind of all my dream musicians I wanted in the band. Yeah. You know, um Adrian Vandenberg, Vandenberg and Tommy, Tommy Aldridge yeah. and My and God. the great Steve I. Yep. Oh yeah. Which came later, yeah, exactly. And Rudy Sarzo. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's so, just unbelievable. And did was there fighting going on in that process too with you and Coverdale in terms of even that happening, or did he start to realize well, he's on to something, we have to, you know, follow through with that, or is there a constant battle about that? A constant battle. Wow. Interesting. That's just it's all, just all the time. I'm but just he, in shock. His career was at its zenith. Zenith, yeah. I mean, he had never been as big ever as he was in that period. I mean, that was a worldwide AOR smash. He was yeah, touring. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. I mean, I got more praise from Rupert Perry, the head of EMI, than I got from David Coverdale. Well, because wow. you probably were making their job a lot easier. Well, I was making them a fortune because the record was gigantic but i mean never got any any accolades or thanks from david coverdale and toward the end of finally recording the record i'm i paid for his room at le mondrian what at the time was a hotel but slash um apartment building that's how little money he had wow Wow. yeah that's just stunning to me you say a lot of thanks that i get for it when he he announces in June or whenever it was that he's not uh, he's not going to have anything to do with me again, which I have no idea re- any reason why that would be. Yeah, I mean, like, why would he bring something like that up now? I mean, that's just so so strange to me. It it, yeah. was, it was bizarre. It was very very bizarre. Um, 
You know, John, I, I guess I want to ask you, I mean, you know, when you speak about all this, I mean, there, there's, there's got to be a, an emotional component to this that, you know, it, it, it takes its toll on you emotionally. Um, I know you spoke about the fact that you were very, very clear, and, you know, David discussed this with you, that you were not friends with the artist. But at the same time, you know, were you ever concerned taking this tactic and having this experience so many times that you were going to be either alienating or damaging your working relationship with the artists that you had to work with? No. I, my job was to ha make them be able to or force them to have hit songs so that they would, their money came from touring at the time. And I never gave it a second thought. Years later, from the end of my active career, you know, year, a few years ago to now, I pretty much have PTSD, you know, like many soldiers do, because I have bad dreams about the artist like almost every week and I have to get therapy for it. So that's how it affects you if you're going to take that kind of tact in order to get that done because you're not getting any you're not getting any thanks or love from the artists that you love yeah, yeah. But, and, and but that that's you how it is that's it, how it is and that you contributed so much emotionally and creatively and financially, financially and yeah. culturally I mean, I just, to their world i mean it's you know it's um I don't know. I mean, the only the only artist that ever got me a gift was Aerosmith because of Tim Collins. Interesting. Wow. No, I mean, and you it, know, Cher Cher got, never did anything for me ever. Interesting. But she was, you know, probably, you know, the worst person that I ever worked with. Wow. Wow. Let me ask you, John, what artists uh, that you worked with? that were completely open to your creative input regarding their material, were there any that, you know, welcomed you with open arms? John Bon Jovi. Really? Yeah, now, tell us about that. Tell us about that, because he was on a competitive label, I think. Yeah, and uh, I really wanted to work with him, and David Geffen said, okay, you can go ahead and work with him as, as long as you're just doing your thing at, at Geffen, and um, he's the one that appreciated my input on his songs and recording the most. And that's the only person I can think of is, is him, especially him. He, he and Richie Sambor appreciated everything I did for them. Wow. What period was that that you were working with him during? So from 87 through his first solo record, okay. 94, 95. So, so it was like that New Jersey area era? Yeah, that's right. Okay. New Jersey up until his... Our solo record. You know, you mentioned Cher, and I, I wanted to talk about that because, you know, as I mentioned, one of the things that I so admired about you is that you had, as an A&R executive, such a broad breadth of scope of talents with not only being able to work with the White Snakes and the Asias and the Aerosmiths and revive their careers, but that you were also able to work with an artist like a Cher or, you know, a singer who is not self-contained, who does not write their own material. And I, I'm curious, you know, what were you looking for when you worked with her? What were you looking for in the songs that you were selecting for her? Uh, and I guess, you know, the other part was how was she to work with at the time, but you've, you've already stated she was Well, Well, um, like you had mentioned, it was really the peak of my, you know, career. And so I had first choice to all these great songs. Right. I didn't really, most of the artists I had were self-contained bands. So I thought to myself, what could I do with these songs? So I convinced her to record again, even though she didn't want to at the time because she was making three movies back to back. So, and no one wanted to produce her. I had, a, that's why Michael Bolton produced her and John Bon Jovi produced her and, and Desmond, but I asked a lot of big producers, Barry Gibb and Giorgio Moroder, and nobody wanted to produce her. In any case, I was determined because I, I had these hit songs and I, I found really good producers. All I would do is I'd have Peter Asher, who was also a producer, go get the key that we would 
record the track in. She hadn't. She didn't even hear the songs. I picked the songs. I cut the tracks with various producers. She would come in and sing for three hours. That's all she would give me, and she would leave. Then I would mix the songs, and that would be the record. Wow! But she was so she was so talented in a, being able to sing a song as long as I gave her the direction of what the song was, because she could hear. I I pretty much played the finished the tracks were finished when she sang to them. Right. Which is very unusual for an artist to do. In any case, she always was able to sing the songs really well but you know that was the extent of her participation and um i got the least amount of thanks and the least amount of respect from her in fact she wouldn't even, i was in australia once and her manager wouldn't even give me a ticket to her show in uh, sydney australia well you know what's interesting about that john is that you know i wonder did she have a good relation i mean she knew david for many many years uh prior to that and you would have thought that she would have i mean did you let david know that she was this difficult well david david's the one that told me don't make a record with her oh he did okay interesting and so, so i said i want to because obviously it was my ego and he said, well, this is what you get. You wanted it, You got. this is what you got. So he warned you that this would be, okay. But you completely... Yeah, he, he warned me. You completely revived her recording career. I mean, when, when it came out and you had all of those hits, and then, you know, I think even a couple of years later, you had the uh, After All that I think Peter produced from the movie. Right, yeah. and she wouldn't even, she wouldn't even sing a duet with P Peter Satira because she thought he was a hack so he had a he they sang it separately and Peter Asher put it together wow wow she was a real snot snob and lazy and ungrateful and she she was like the least joyful artist ever to work with wow. and That's so and sad. the the most disappointing person yeah, it's always it's always sad when you, especially when you've had such success with someone that they still feel that way or that they're so negative and so disappointing as a person. But I guess you know, you know, it's the, the, the most interesting part about what you've said to me beyond the sadness is how David warned you don't make a record with her. It's almost like he intuitively knew what you were going to get into. Yep, he he totally warned me for real. Yeah. Not even. Subtly. But he must have loved this, the enormous success that, that you brought, the enormous you know career revival of her on his label. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure he did. But um, it's a very unpleasant subject because it was so, I was so successful with her and she was so uncooperative in every way. Wow. Wow. Well, that leads me to the next question. What, what have your biggest pref you know, professional mistakes taught you, John? Well, I tried to learn from all my professional mistakes in, in order to make good music. And um, most of the professional mistakes I can't change now, especially not being a royalty participant since I don't have continuing income from all the records I made. You know, I, I remember an interview that you once gave, John, where you spoke about a time when you went to therapy to examine, you know, certain self-destructive behaviors. And was that process helpful to you at that time in your work with artists? Yes, it's very helpful to me. I mean, I, I continued, I think Geffen had suggested it early on. And um, by doing it, it really helped me to retain my focus when I, I got all this negativity about cha changing their music. So that was a very, as usual, you know, wise suggestion from him. But I think it was critical to go to therapy to examine yourself and your own problems or things which would get in your way, yes. And do you continue to find it helpful today? Yes, I do. Okay. No, I'm asked because you mentioned earlier that you, you know, you have certain, like the, the PTSD thing on, on, on artists, and we were talking about that earlier, and that, you know, therapy has been helpful in that regard, so... Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, John, you've worked with some legendary music executives, you know, the who's who, Ahmed Erdogan, uh, David Geffen, Donna Anner. Can can you talk a little bit about what you learned from each of them? Well, I, I learned mostly everything 
from David Geffen and um, some things from from Jerry Greenberg and Amon Erdogan. By it, by it, by the time I went to Columbia, you know, I was pretty much you know my own kind of executive and and did did everything. I mean, I, I didn't get that wasn't a big learning place at Columbia. But at Geffen, there was an enormous. I mean, that was yeah. a, it was a huge stretch of your career as well, time-wise. Yeah, and especially, well, it was 15 years, and and Sony was 10 years, and Atlantic Records was only six years. What was it about David that, be, that, that I guess, impressed you the most? I mean, you, you've said that he was like one of the smartest people, you, the smartest person you have ever met. But from a creative level, I mean, was it... What was it about him that impressed you the most uh, in in having him as a boss? That he stayed out of the creative aspect of music because he said he didn't understand anything about the music that was being made in the 80s. And he said, so I'll stay out of it and I'll let you do your thing. Just don't make mistakes more than once. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I remember in, it must have been eighty nine or ninety. He, you know, he went through that period when when he sold the company. He gave a few interviews and he said one of the great regrets that he had professionally during the Geffen years was suing Neil Young. Do you remember that period? That yeah. Time? Yes. Do you remember what his motivations were or his his instincts behind doing that at the time? Because it was no. an unusual thing to, to to do that for for the reasons that he was doing it. I mean, it was highly unusual. Yeah. No, um, I don't know anything about that because, as you can, as you know from interviewing me, I was so busy every minute. There's no reason to be involved. Think about it. No one asked my opinion or anything. So I have I have no idea about any any of the, those conflicts with him and his former artists. You know, I, I want to ask you sort of a, a creative, personal question. You, when you listen to new music today, John, do, do you listen as a fan, or do you listen with your A and R ear, or, or or how do you how do you approach when you hear things that you've never heard before? Like if a song comes on that that catches your ear, I listen as an A and R person, my A and R ear, and that the problem is that only applies to country music, you know, modern country music. And once in a while, a Taylor Swift song or a Lady Gaga song, most of the music that I hear today is sounds like kind of half-assed vocals, and it's garbage. So I don't listen to any modern music on pop radio or even rock radio that's, that's listenable. If I want to listen to something... I'll listen to, you know, one of the XM country stations that plays modern country records, which sounds, most of them sound like great 80s rock records. Yes, and most of them, I mean, when it's funny, when you go to the concerts, most of them are, you know, rock concerts. They're, I mean, you know, they have the that, huge that, Marshall that's stacks. Cor- that's sounds, correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Florida Georgia Line or... Yeah. You know, Jason Aldean or any of those superstars Eric that are Church, yeah, all Eric of them. Church, yeah, yes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so have, have that 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 those are the rock stars now, and then of course all the all the old stars. And it's funny because when I went to the Eagles to see to see um, Don Henley and Vince Gill was there. You know, I mean, nobody could replace Glenn Fry, uh, one of the most important people ever in in the music business. But Finn Skill is an amazing art country artist who fit right into the Eagles. Yes, and he has that beautiful voice. So it, beautiful uh, voice, and yeah. Don Henley knew that. Yeah, and brought Don Henley and probably Irving Azoff. Yeah, and, and you know, it's funny. I mean, I guess it's interesting because you know they brought in. Uh, Glenn's son, but I guess he doesn't do the majority of Glenn's vocals, does he? That's right. No, he does some, but Vince Gill is is, is singing mostly. It's funny. Earlier on, they took my guitar player from Sean Colvin to be in the Eagles. Oh, oh well. Stewart, um, forget his last name, but he, he, I found him for Sean Colvin. Yeah, that you know, when, it's when funny. I made when I made that's one one of the things I got a Grammy for was that Sean Colvin. Yeah, that's a great Colvin album. Came home. Yeah, she that, hates me too. She hates me too because <laughs> really the, wow. ori- the original the original title of Sonny Came Home is Forty Red Men. Wow. 
and I had a fight with her. John Leventhal just almost passed out from the fight I had with her to change the lyric. How interesting. I mean, he almost passed out. I mean, he produced that record, didn't he? He was, and he is a great producer. Yeah, he he produced is, that yeah. record. He was so great. I wanted them to produce the Eagles at the time, but I don't wow. think they were up for having a producer then. Interesting. Very um, interesting. John, are, are there any books for our audience, uh, any books, films, etc., that you found particularly inspirational that you would recommend for an artist to read or watch? That's really a good question. I think the most inspirational thing for any artist, if somebody wants to see a complete vision of an entity of work of art, is Breaking Bad. <laughs> the entire... Mm. Yeah. seasons the all, all of breaking bad yeah. there because Vince Gilli- Gillian had a vision from beginning to end of the show he would not let Sony pay him you know millions of dollars to do another season and so that is what real art is is that kind of vision because he knew exactly what he was doing and and do you think that that might have been your thing that you you had such a clear vision beginning to end from these artists that you work with and that's what it was maybe that you know it, it's very similar yes yeah I mean he I think he took it to even a higher level because he had you know he had more he had enough money to say enough right. so that is probably the thing that that I lacked but. But it was it's the same concept yeah. of from you know of a of a, a singular artistic vision. Yeah, which he did beautifully over six seasons. I think it's six seasons. I think of that show, wasn't it? Six, or right? Five, yeah. yeah, and like five or six. Yeah, and it's an astonishing work in that each season. I mean, it's funny. I have watched. I was I was very late to it. I you know in in this era of the last you know eighteen years where so much brilliant TV has come. Uh, I caught some shows. I didn't catch that until later. And then I caught up with at least the first four seasons on DVD. And one of the things about it, as you were speaking, I was realizing is that the evolution of the way that that character evolved each season and was so uncompromising and so brilliantly written and executed. Uh, it, it, it It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And, you know, I knew Gilligan's work uh, from, you know, he did a lot of the X-Files stuff, right. which was that, in the that, 90s. That's yeah. right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's just funny you would mention that because, you know, that's that's considered to be one of the great masterpieces of the last 20 years. I mean, in the era of great TV, you know. I mean, And I you, believe they're making a film now. They are making yeah, a yeah, film. I mean, yeah, it, I mean, the goal, it's considered the golden age of, of TV. Television, yep. And and most of the times when I see people polled, that's all weeks comes in at number one as mm-hmm. the as the greatest program of the golden age of TV, the greatest series. So I mean it's not related to music, but it's a similar thing it, of, yeah. gra- of great art. Yeah. Yeah, very, very much so. Um John, what advice would you have for an artist today who wants a career in the music business? I would say to have as much musicality as you can in terms of playing an instrument, piano or guitar, to work on your vocal as much as you can, and obviously try to study songwriting because that's the basis of of everything, and then attempt to get somebody who can produce music that obviously it has to fit into today's world but it should still be great. So I don't know how to join those two anymore, but I used to know perfectly, so that's what matters. <laughs> and how do you feel like you don't do that anymore? What what? Is oh, it- because I don't understand like the music that is played on most radio stations. Gotcha. I, don't, I don't understand it at all because it's not. It's mostly sound. Right. There's there's percussion instruments and vocal sounds there's not a generally you know there's not generally a vocal like lady gaga from you know a star is born or a taylor swift song or you know jason aldean or keith urban you know they're they're generally i don't hear music like that now right yeah it's you know i i remember 
comment you made about that that smash that Justin Bieber had. And I remember thinking the same exact thing that you said in the interview where you talked about, you said, I'm listening to this song and I'm thinking, my God, is this a demo? And, and I thought the same thing because it sounds like it was done on some small little keyboard as like a four track demo, but it's, you know, it just has, you know, a little better sound, but it's so sparse. Right, so exactly. Sparse, yeah. And so I find so much of, so it's hard for me to judge a lot of the modern artists because that's how they record and they record their vocals through all kind of processors. So I, I can't really tell if they're good singers or not right. good singers. I mean, there, there's so much processing on the vocal sound and on, on the other sound. And also the sounds are so compressed, I don't really understand it. J John, what are your thoughts on Greta Van Fleet? Have you heard the album? No, I've no? not heard it. Okay. No. Well, it's very interesting because, you know, rock bands today don't seem to have any connection with youth culture. This is the one rock band, uh, you know, Jason Flom signed it, that, that has... Oh, had, yeah, well, then I, and, uh, I, I would have to listen to it because he would know. Yeah, and, and what, what it is is that it's, it's funny because, you know, older people listen to this and think this is a complete and utter ripoff of Led Zeppelin. It's like Led Zeppelin light. I mean, the phrasing, the guitar, the blue, you know... And even his vocal approach is very plant-esque. I mean, it, it is. And yet, what's fascinating is that the audience that they have attracted is not, you know, people our age who remember Zeppelin and love them, but it's the, you know... It's, well, it's a cross of both, because they had they do have an older audience, but yeah, they're they, just okay, newer generation. Newer gen that's yeah. into them. And yet you wonder, what is it about that that particular band that makes them stand out among all the other rock bands that have come and gone in this era that that can't get any attention or can't get an audience. Yeah, I think it's just the the idea of what once was. I mean, they they are a great band. I mean, they look great. I mean, you know, good looking guys. The whole they've got it seems like the whole kind of package together. But yeah, I mean, it is very extremely heavily. Led Zeppelin yeah, influence. Yeah, like, exactly. I mean, if you close your eyes, you would think it's like, oh, this is a new single from Led Zeppelin. Right. It's like they've been gone for 30 years. I mean, it's that, you know, just from the opening track. You yeah, know, right, right, right. Yeah. So let, let me ask you, John, for, for someone who wants to pursue a career as an A&R executive, what advice do you have for them? I would say to invent a video game <laughs> and forget A&R. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All and right. I'm being serious, not oh, okay. being a joker or an asshole. No, no. Okay. okay. All right. So you don't feel that that's a viable career option anymore for someone? I do not, no. Okay. Unless, they, unless they're a lover of country music, want to move to Nashville and work with the great musicians there who actually play their instruments and sing. So... If you want to be an A and R and try to get into the music business, you have to be in Nashville. You have to physically be there. You could try that, but in terms of, you know, A and R in London, New York, and Los Angeles, I would say pursue a different career. Okay. How, John, how does one get in touch with you? Is it is it through your website? It's through my website. And usually the guy that runs my website, you know, will weed out interesting questions because I get a lot of, you know, different things. That's why I'm not on social media because, you know, a lot of people, you know, they'll say you ruined Aerosmith or, you know, oh, you, just like any other you, social yeah. media, right. you get mostly negative things. How interesting that on, just on social media, they, they know who you are and they, they come after you. In that way, yeah, they do. Wow. Well, yeah, as well, far as all, I'm concerned, all, 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 the, uh, all the time. As far as I'm concerned, you're a legend. I mean, like <laughs> literally a legend. I mean, a legend is such a legend that you're. That I remember the credits of your album saying John Kaladner, John Kaladner. That's how much of a legend you are. Well, by, by the by the way, John, where did that where did that whole element of John Kaladner, John Kaladner come from? Where, where did that start from? Okay, so we were working on Double Vision. And foreigner, okay. Well, I, a foreigner, civil <laughs> vision in 1978. So I wasn't the manager, I wasn't the producer. Um, so Mick Jones was trying to figure out what my credit should be because he wanted to give me a credit because I, 
you know, picked the songs with him and I, you know, I picked the producer, I picked the mixer, just everything I would do with my artist. So he said, well, you know what, you're you. So that's what it's going to be. And since it's double vision, right. he came up with the idea there'd be two, John Kolodner, Colin, John Kolodner. Right. Wow. So he invented that. And and it stuck. I mean, I remember and it seeing that. Yeah, it, it stuck. stuck. Yeah, it stuck because you would see that on all the on things. All the John records, Kaladner, yeah. John Kaladner, and that became that became almost like your uh, what, what's the word? The trademark, like, like your, your yeah, yeah like I a mean, trademark was... for you. Yeah, exactly. And it's really funny in the waning years of a physical product. I see that Atlantic Records and Sony took a lot of John Kaladner, John Kaladner's off of the record. Interesting. Really? Yeah. yeah. You it's mean great. off of the credits or off of the yeah off of the credits person? yeah off wow of the credits. how interesting I I didn't even know I I mean because all yeah. the ones that I have you know the original CDs the have original that yeah, yeah all yeah. the originals yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely but absolutely. you know the other the other talentless executives didn't like that so oh, wow. that's what happens well. Wow. John, I, I really, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to do this. It, it means the world to me that, yeah, that, to that us. you did this and, and yeah. to us that, that, that you took the time. And I'm very, very, very grateful to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank, thank you. I appreciate it. I, it's interesting to talk to, to people that really, you know, like music and understand it and know a little about my career. And so it, it, it's my pleasure to have you know, talk to you about this. Thanks again. We really appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. Truly one of the great A&R people of all time. I would, I would agree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hands down. I mean, Legendary. You know, this, this is a man who I have admired, you know, my entire career. And, you know, I think, you know, we mentioned in the interview, you know, he almost came to work for Arista. Right. I know we, we, we had wanted to talk to him. We did talk to him, and he did not want to do A and R for a company on the West Coast that was based on the East Coast. That, Interesting. That, that was the reason, you know, that, right. that he gave for for turning it down at that time. So, and and I think part of the reason for that was that he was doing that for Atlantic, right? And found and and probably you know did not like to be away from that centralized, you know, exactly core element. So, um, and, and you know, and I think that this is one of the most revealing interviews we've ever done ever oh, absolutely i mean there were things in there that were revelations to me and i think you know that that he's never spoken about he mentioned you know right. that he's never talked about that and he was so honest and so forthcoming about so many aspects both personal and professional absolutely you know and you know when he talked about you know uh one of the points that i liked was you know what he looked for an artist uh, or, you know, what you look for an artist that had changed over the years. And I thought that the criteria that he had served them well, which was, you know, do, does the band have two or three hit songs in them? Right. Uh, do they have a great singer uh, slash front man, which we kind of established that would be like kind of like, you know, somebody that stood out like an Eddie Van Halen or if it was the singer or, right. you know, somebody else. It's one person in that band that could be a standout. Yes, a and, star. Yeah, exactly. And I thought that that obviously has just served him well. Yeah. Um, and you look at the people who he has been responsible for, you right. know, all, you know, have that quality. I mean, he's always gone for that particular uh, element within his signings, you know, which I think is important. You have to have that person that's going to communicate, which, which we talked about in the previous episodes about having a great communicator that's going to convey the message in a way that's going to hit home with the audience. Absolutely. It's like they are your representative, that that lead person or that that, you know, front person is the one to do that. And if you don't have that charismatic, maybe that's not the right vehicle for you then, right. you know, music. I thought one of the other insightful things that he talked about, and I'm sure you'll agree, was, you know, how did he develop such great A&R instincts? Yes. And, and, and I thought, you know, he just said that he knew it from a very early age. This yes. is another, you know, another guy that we've had on that knew this right from the get-go. He knew it innately. Yeah. I mean, he talked about that. He said, I always knew. He could pick out songs on the radio and yes. just knew that they, those were going to be hits. And he was always right. Right. He was always right. You know, yeah, um, yeah. That that was an interesting one because you know what you're getting there is you're getting someone's, you know, and we've talked about this before. You're getting someone's, you know, why, right. like why they do something. I mean, this was obvious that 
this was his destiny. It, absolutely. You know? and, I, and I thought that another thing that was very meticulous and methodical about him is that he would, when he would make a mistake, he would learn from it and say, I'll never do that again. Exactly. And then he just kind of iterated and continued and continued. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's like, what's that famous expression? What is the definition of insanity? Doing, Doing the, same the same thing, thing over and over and right. over, but expecting it to a be a different result. result. Right. I mean, that's, that's, you know, and so, but trust me, I mean, it's easier said than done. Yeah. I mean, we all know that it's very human, you know, where we have made the same, I mean, I know I have made the same mistake, the same mistake. And you wonder like, how long am I going to keep doing this before I change the behavior? Right. You know? Yeah. And I, and I thought another interesting thing about this uh, part of the interview where he was talking about how he taught a lot of the stuff to Rick Rubin. Yes. And I kind of spoke to you before we went yeah. to record this, that it, you know, now that I think about it, I think Rick Rubin was a big inf influence. You know, he was very influenced by John. By John. In a lot of ways. Because he, he brought him into Geffen. Right. Right. He brought him into Geffen. Exactly. You know. Um you know, uh, one of the other things that I that I loved was, you know, did any of your signings exceed his expectations? And he really couldn't say, which for yeah. obvious reasons, with all the success that he had, I think the only thing he could point to was when he hooked up, you know, Sammy Hagar with Van Halen. Yes, and, and that, that just skyrocketed. Just skyrocketed. Yeah. Yeah. And the interesting thing, and we we've talked about this before, is that. The interesting part about that is that you never know with situations like that. Right. When you're introducing a brand new singer to a, let's a, be honest, a, a, a legendary band, right. act, right. you know, um, I mean, it's almost a similar thing, although they weren't quite at the same stage as when... ACDC introduced the Back in Black album. Right. It was After introducing. Bon Scott it. died. Yeah. Bon Scott died. Who knew if the world would accept right. the band with a brand new singer? Right. You know, they had made, what, two, three albums with, with Bon? No, more than that. Four? There was like about Be six or seven prior to that. That were prior to Back yeah. in Black? <laughs> yes. Okay. I, yeah. I didn't realize they'd made yeah. that many. Yeah. Um, and, and who knows if the world's going to accept that. Right. That Especially it, after a guy that was so loved in the band. I mean, they loved yes. Bon Scott. So. Yes, exactly. And would that work? And not only did it work, but it's become, you know, it's legendary. That to go album. even higher, which yes. is, and, and which is kind of the same situation, whether you love Roth or whether you love uh, Sammy Hagar, it did go higher. That was their first number one record. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so... I, the only other example I can think of is like Iron Maiden when, you know, uh, Paul Deano left the band and they got Bruce Dickinson. That skyrocketed even higher than where they were previously. So there's a few examples, but extremely, extremely rare. rare. It's very rare, especially when you have something that somebody is so established and the hits have been so, you know. Right, uh, forthcoming to suddenly change course like that. It's um, and, 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 and another one that I thought that you... Uh, really wanted to comment on was about, you know, the quote, which I love, which was, you know, all great art comes from psychic pain. Yes. And there were some points that I know that, uh, you know, came to mind for you. Well, yeah, you know, it, it, what came to mind for me is, is he said something when, when we asked him that question, which I thought was just fascinating because I've heard other artists, extremely talented, legendary talents speak about this is that, you know, Whenever there is that immense of talent, you know, or, you know, huge ego, right. there is an equal amount of huge insecurity, insecurity that comes with it. And no one likes to talk about that. They like to just see people as, you know, they're just an asshole or just an egomaniac. Right. But with that, and, 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 you know, people can think that about somebody who's brilliant or somebody who they don't even think is brilliant, but who they think is, the, the person thinks is brilliant. It, it's it's a combination. It's a yin and a yang. Yep. And it's, it's like the light and dark. And he mentioned that. He said, you know, with the, you know, immense talent comes... Huge ego and, and you know right the uh, uh, it and, 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 that and, comes it, with and that. it creates great art and you see it over and over and over yes. happening that great documentary of with Aerosmith uh, when they were the making of Pump yeah. where they're really in there and they're just going at it on each other and I mean what a great documentary to yes. look at that or like the Metallica documentary when you're talking about you know the whole mental health of the band where they seeked out an actual therapist yes to uh, try to help them through the oh, issues that they were monster? dealing with yes yes that, that's excellent um, what it's like and 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 those kinds of things also I thought really examine group dynamic 
Right. What it's like, you know, in a group dynamic. I think it's a little different if you're a solo artist because you're right. the one in charge you're the and one you in don't charge. have exactly. that di- same that dynamic. dichotomy. Right, right, right. No, but the Metallic one, yeah, I mean, I love that documentary. Yeah, that's an amazing The Aerosmith amazing. one, yeah, great illustrations of that point. Um, Absolutely. Also, uh, because, I mean, this had so many points that we have to cover, but, but we have to because this is just a mind-blowing interview. Uh, I, I like the, 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 the part in the interview where we talked about, you know, with him, that you know that you, he's not friends with the artist that's yeah. and did that damage your relationship with them yeah absolutely you know the truth is when you're in the position that john was in when you're in a and i learned this from clive davis working for clive you can't be friends with the artist you just can't i mean and, and truthfully if if truth be known they don't want that Right. They don't want you to be their friend. They want, you know, as much as they may, you know, bitch and moan and complain and, and be brutal, they want you to give them, you know, the best piece of creative, you know, help that they can. You may be brutalized for it. Right. But, you know, like John said. Well, there's a lot of money resting on this. Exactly. The, behind us. It's his job to get you the best songs possible. And if that means cooking you up with other people to write them, if that means putting you in situations that are going to create that, you know, psychic pain. So you're right. going to get great, great stuff. Um, it, it's very interesting. You know, I, I, I've heard this in other fields. The the in in music I remember Bjork the 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 singer Amazing. Bjork when she made her very first film it was called Dancer in the Dark and it was a it was a great film it was Lars von Trier and it was about a woman who was going blind and losing her sight and what she was doing to try to you know uh, help her son before she went blind and he you know is known for just. Being He's very in, eccentric, very yeah. eccentric, and 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 the experience was so difficult on her, so psychically difficult. Right. She, she said she would never work with him again. And, she would never work with him again, and she'd never make movies again. Right. But when you watch this movie, although there's a new one coming out, I think that she's making. I forget what the name of it is, but I just a narrative about, movie. If, oh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah. it's been twenty something years. Right, Maybe she's right. at a different station of life. But when you watch this film, you realize, my God, what he got out of her, the power. And that's pretty hard. But for someone who had no experience acting, I mean, it's like, right? it was really powerful. So I know what he was talking about. And that's, it's a very fine line. And, and, you know, you, but what was most, I think, um, moving to me on that subject was at the time, perhaps John didn't feel it, but he talks about the, the, I think he even used the term like the PTSD quality of how those relationships ended up ended up and and how he suffers from that now and he looking has to go to that, therapy yeah and going yeah. to therapy and dealing with that there is psychic damage from that you know right. for him and i thought that was very 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 sad that that, yeah. that 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 you know that it had that kind of impact on him right you know i agree i agree it's uh it's tragic because when you think of all the success you'd figure that the relationships would be good but i guess it was such a destructive thing with you know the music and everything so um but i think uh you know uh the final thought was you know that we talked about was going into therapy to self-examine his this, his self-destructive uh, behaviors yes you know and i that was really fascinating to me because you know, if, if you know anything about David Geffen, the one thing about David Geffen as, you know, beyond just the reputation that he has is that David was always a seeker. Right. Always was a seeker. David never poo-pooed therapy, seminars, bettering yourself. Right. David. He encouraged it. And did it himself. Right. That's what a lot of people don't know and about I think David Geffen. And encouraged John to do it. certainly encouraged John to, to learn and to go into therapy. And that wasn't just something like, you know, oh, well, you should do it. Right. It was something that he was he willing was to at, at, right. in his own life as well. And I always, you know, that's not something that's well known about David Geffen. And I thought, you know, when he said that about that David encouraged him to do that, I thought that was really, really interesting uh, that he would, you know, do that and very, very re- revelatory of John to talk about just th- that he would acknowledge the destructive behaviors in himself and say, you know, I need to stop this. I need to go to therapy. I need to deal with this. 
Hey, Insiders, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Caboteglo, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast.